Welcome to the Green Ring and thanks for watching. This video is fifth in a series of nine presenting a note by note analysis of Wagner's Das Rheingold, Scene 4. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly literature, it's a massive journey that aspires to examine in its entirety Der Ring des Nibelungen to its final note. I hope you'll take this voyage with me, one I'm dedicated to completing. For an explanation of who I am and more on the reasons for this series, please check out my preface video. Its link is supplied below along with those for the other videos preceding this one. We pick up where we left off at the moment Loge and Fro begin heaping gold around Freya in Dover's full score on the second stave of page 252. The cadence which prefaces the god's toil is like a flag dropped to start a race, Loge and Fro hopping to work as the treaty cannon resumes more athletically and without words. Three matching iterations, each raised a second from the last, its leading voice in tubas with cellos contrabasses taking the second. To this, violas add a third and swifter line as a kind of descant, its rising notes a crotchet tied to a rising triplet, the crotchet tie at its top leading to a full Nibelung tattoo, only to slide down a quasi-spear triplet scale. Adding to this busy confusion, other instruments alternate by doubling their individual portions of the viola line, bassoons rising on the wanted treaty, then doubled by two horns following a portion of the tattoo, after which bass clarinet slides down the viola's concluding triplet scale. Meanwhile, after the treaty cannon's first measure, timpani twice launched giant thumps on the downbeat of every other measure, echoed by two horns on the middle beat, and answered in a cymbal crotchet on the next downbeat. With the low string spare portion of the third treaty strophe, two trombones take over the giant thumps, while two more horns double the bassoon's treaty and tattoo strophes, bassoons adding the falling triplet scale in the next measure, all adding progressive density to the sequence in sonic imitation of what should be an increasing pile on stage. While this stress on the orchestration may seem needlessly detailed, it's crucial to show the Meister utilizing every orchestral device possible to highlight his syntax, demonstrating how important to his storytelling it is. With this mix's last strophe, woodwinds, horns quickly augment then combine with violas for two measures of relentless tattoo iterations, while tubas and low strings perform a fascinating syntactic trick. The tattoo draws most of the year's attention, especially as the united symbols here add a disturbing crescendo roll. Even so, while the distinctive giant turn marches along in octava low strings, cubas directly above twice intone its inversion. This might be dismissed as no more than a reminder of the giants themselves, a poor rationale given so much of their other syntax amply fills that bill during this passage. The turn already has a notable history dominating the texture when the giants abduct Freya in scene 2, only to return in the scene 3-4 interlude as part of Erda's promise that, by giving up the goddess, Fasolt especially looks to gain some as yet undisclosed boon. Most recently and unexpectedly, it resurfaces in the raging coda to Alberich's curse, carrying with it connotations of a world after the dwarf loses his ring, thus fired with the racial urge to regain it. Meanwhile, both its original and its rising falling versions occur side by side in Loge's scene to advice for Votan on acquiring the ring. The opposition of these two modules here marries all these notions, implying Fafner's lust for the gold against Fasolt's longing to mate with Freya, Alberta's schemes for regaining his treasure, and the gods' plans for defeating both dwarf and giants. Sabor makes an interesting comment at this juncture. The forge and giant motifs sound simultaneously. Fafner is creating his own Nibelheim. Sabor has no sense of the giant turn as its own module, nor do the ideas of racial change play any part in his analysis. 
Even so, he does seem to intuit their effects here, a kind of transformation very like that experienced by Albrecht's Nibelungs, one wrought by the trauma of involvement with the ring, which has already begun to affect the giants. Combined with the stage action, this music to accompany the progressive obscuring of Freya, Source of Love, seems to bury itself into the giant's racial and sexual makeup, warping it. Apparently, they too fall into a trap laid by Erida through Loge, one meant to physically alter them into something quite different from what they are now. The moment this bundle ends, Fafner barks they're not packing the gold tightly enough, vocal bouncing up a tritone to fall on the Velterb triad, then move through a quasi-nibbling triplet in a static ash interval capped by lifting an Erida fourth. Just as Alberich goads his brethren with leaping intervals and sinking triads, so does Fafner abuse the gods, in effect rehearsing for what the evil giant hopes is his own race's future world hegemony thanks to the Horde. This inspires a trill of pagetura in violas, both Fafner's sensual delight in the prospects for his race, and Fafsel's shiver at this ever more effective loss of his desired mate, while low strings intone a pair of giant thumps, strident horns sustaining the first note of a tattoo turn, to resolve it in the next measure with two pulses of its signature static rhythm, a timpani giant thump beneath each. These two measures repeat for emphasis, but the second varies its tattoo syncopations to align them with the giant's vocal, a pair of bouncing air to fourths, Fafner adding a reverse ash interval to the second. It's only here, horns resuming their static one-note tattoo pulse, a timpani giant thump on every third beat, that the horde makes what seems a rather tardy entrance on bass, tuba, and bassoons, though likely to suggest the treasure assuming its final shape as a mountain of wealth. Above its six repetitions, Fafner and Loge bicker to lines of static notes ended by falling intervals, a fifth, fourth, and third. With Loge's first complaint, the horde repeats in place as violets join in at an abrasive major second above the horns to supplement their continual tattoo. Meanwhile, the vocals become purely static lines dragged up that second, Fafner's including two static ash intervals. With the last measure of this tense development, contrabass tuba joins bass tuba and strengthened bassoons in the last horde strophe, which turns back on itself to resemble not only the god turn, but also produce a terminal heroic strophe on a rising octave exactly as first heard on Flosshilda's lips in scene one. Usually imperceptible in the orchestral mix, an oboe and clarinet simultaneously lift octavo through a high ash interval on a heroic fifth. Passing the gold to the giants is, after all, the next step in its ultimate return to the Rhine, thus vindicating both nymphs and Erida. Horn's violas taper away on a last tattoo pulse and timpani thump, Photon resuming his complaints of shame, his vocal that same bundle of Freya and reverse chord notes, strings adding poignant harmony on air to chords, while Horn's bassoons repeat giant thumps. As first violins rise in a Freya ghost, Fricka leaps in to berate him for Freya's misery, an extended grievance begun by echoing her consort's line, then an eerie version of resignation tailed out by reverse chord notes, to produce, as stressed in first violins, a strange truncated echo of the giant turn, so recently implied. An oboe rises out of this on a clear version of Freya's arpeggio, which a flute concludes with its love module, as, after singing a Freya distortion, leaping up a fourth and down a poignant sixth into reverse chord notes, Fricka pursues her rebuke to another even more pitiful resignation strophe, this one strengthened by violins, in the morphemes more wanted third harmonization, her vocal ended in another reverse chord note pulse to again evoke the giant turn. At some level, then, Wotan's consort intuits the giant's justified complaint. Now entirely swaddled by the string choir, cellos rising in another Freya arpeggio crib, her last plaint begins on the words, Berzaman, 
set to a reverse ash interval on a seventh, an all-too-brief window of insight opened between the Earth Mother and Fricka, which the concert goddess finishes with the loose Freya variant to sink on reverse melody notes in a last hint of resignation. Horns surge back with two strophes of a tattoo variant, the first note held over Fricka's last words, its first syncopated pulse bouncing down and up a fourth to oppose Fafner's renewed calls for more horde, his bounce on a rising fourth separated by a dotted crotchet rest from two consecutive ones on a fifth and fourth, while bassoon's tubas exchange giant thumps with timpani. Low strings launch a giant thump which becomes a swelling upward scale as octavo violas take the static tattoo in a last hail of static triplets that becomes a sextuplet tremolo as Donner enters the fray. Orchestrally, this amounts to the same procession of morpheme-neutral scales with chord stings first heard in their scene two contretemps. Donner's vocal, however, is syntax-heavy, even if his words are mere bluster, a Welterb triad defending his hope for wooing, reinforced by a pulse of Freya's love cell, which, after static notes, duplicates the heroic cell on a rising fifth, destined to become that module's most wanted form. Incited by a scale ascending on semiquaver sextuplets and low strings violas, he rises on reverse chord notes into an inverted ash interval, on a fearsome plunging octave as he cries, He here, du Hund! Each of his next three phrases launch on similar rising scales, if now only in low strings, and capped by tuba viola quaver stings. After a low interval on reverse chord notes, followed by a third descent, he lifts through an abandonment triad, but ends oddly in a rhyme maiden taunt. His spirits are as high as the nymphs, if for quite different reasons, and in a very different way, and it's important to note the Welterb triad is a formational part of the nymphs' taunts. As it turns out, this particular bit of syntactic foreshadowing is an important one, specifically in the context of gods mixing with non-godly races, something Donner and Fro, never mind Wotan, can expect to successfully achieve only once Valhalla is secure. After octavo low strings rumble up a scale in semiquaver sextuplets, Fafner responds drolly, his ruish Donner echoing the thunderer's falling octave, his sarcastic little trill doubled by timpani roll and sustained in bassoon cording on the word rolla, a vocal which expands into a taunting heroic echo, the giant's own twisted sort of bravery. Fafner tops his ripos to top staccato string quaver chords, rising on extended melody notes, by singing chord notes, a low ash interval rising a third, and a squat jeering crib of the heroic cell on a third. Over swelling timpani roll and ever more insistent staccato string quaver chords, Donner's last threatening response lifts in reverse chord notes to intone the shape of Alberich's scene one lust, which also implies the giant turn, ended by leaping up and down thirds, a compact reminder his sexual frustrations aren't so different from those of giant or dwarf. Strings rush up a last powerful marcato scale on semiquavers atop a minim horn woodwind pedal at whose crest, as in scene two, Wotan separates the two by singing a stately inverted ash interval whose falling octave echoes those only just sung by the two combatants. This inspires a last quiet cello iteration of the treaty's initial voice, while beginning on static notes, the god surmises that Freya is ransomed as he rises a sixth into a bold iteration of Freya's love module. Fafner examines the pile for chinks over a solitary horn's pedal while violas intone four soft nibelung tattoo variants, which hold the first note as bassoons breathe equally muted strophes of the horde, after which violas complete the tattoo by inverting it. Atop the second reverse tattoo iteration, Logie confirms the sly little touch by reporting the horde is exhausted, his vocal echoing the tattoo's melody notes with a hesitant quaver rest separating the first from the last two in emphasis of his point. 
As handled by all productions currently available to me, the stage business of piling the hoard is invariably among Rheingold's weakest effects. A handful of flimsy props whose disappointing heap, loge, and fro fuss over simply to mark time. Given what they have to work with, as compared to the amount of music, the business never has the desired impact. One historical production, the 1965 Bayreuth version by the Meister's grandson Wieland, hit upon the notion of making the Horde a primitive icon of female fertility, and more recent stagings have explored his innovation. With its usual creativity, Valencia uses golden jumpsuited bodies, though fails to address how these incompletely shield Freya from the giant's eyes, while Vienna's 2016 mounting offers a golden mannequin with the same drawback. These directors certainly didn't grasp the work's syntactic hints of a racial change in the texture of life, but in representing the horde as bodies, they nonetheless tacitly endorsed it. But none present the image of a treasure mighty enough to sway the entire world. In all events, Fafner's inspection triggers a pair of muted horns to sigh one complete pulse of the apple's morpheme, a reminder that for the moment the gift of immortality is Fafner's only concern. Sounding over a lone viola breve tremolo, low strings creep up a chromatic scale to suggest Wotan's trepidation into the bargain as well as Loge's hushed delight. Visual evidence of the giant catching sight of Freya's hair as it glints through the pile is a detail only the most careful production might capture, and none have so much as tried. He demands they cover the hole with the Tarnhelm, the viola tremolo expanding to a third harmony as Fafner sings a static notes begun with a static ash interval followed by a low on a third, after which he bounces on air to fourth to fall a third, thus outlining a 6-4 heroic melody note pulse and its inversion. Loge protests with a rising fourth, but atop the Tarnhelm's first coda, slightly denatured on English horn and bassoons, Fafner doubles down after rising a third on an inverted ash interval with its ominous fifth. Wotan instantly orders the trinket delivered, his static notes ended with the descending fourth to underline this hint he'll sacrifice anything to keep hold of the ring and its nature-wounding power. Second violins glide up a semi-quaver tuplet scale to a light sting on horns, woodwinds, low strings as the fire sprite pitches the Tarnhelm on the heat. With no more than pizzicato quaver string punctuations outlining that version of the chord note opposition defining the Tarnhelm's second segment, Loge's vocal moves through a pair of chagrin pulses, whose intimations of reversed hopes are here at a high pitch, as he asks if they're done so that Freya may be released. Of course he knows full well they're not, since Fasolt hasn't yet had his say. The giant stirs at last from his long melancholy silence to grieve Freya's imminent loss over a single plaintive clarinet pedal, his initial halting vocal of static notes capped with a rising fourth and descending third, while hushed woodwind semi brevi chords evoke a hint of the apples in their aspect of being lost to the gods, an irony here turned against the sorrowing giant. After a crotchet rest, his next static note phrase ends on pathetic chord notes. A viola pizzicato launches a dotted minim rest to completely silence the ensemble, a mark of Fassel's agony. English horns clarinets begin the next measure with a pair of erda chords, atop which he intones two echoing lines of triplet static pulses, capped by falling erda fourths, the second rising by a second with the woodwind's harmony to include a static ash interval. Fasolt scrutinizes the pile in silence as a single horn's pedal supports four cello horde pulses, each punctuated by an octavo viola tattoo strophe missing its first note, a sign both of the exhausted treasure and the giant's eroding hopes. The poignant first oboe rides clarinet bassoon semi brevi cording as it ascends through Freya's complete morpheme to end on melody notes to evoke an echo of that giant turn truncation so eloquent of his loving hopes. 
This even more pathetic ghost of the giant's previous lament marks him catching sight of her eye through the gold. An anxious second violin viola tremolos launch with a forte piano sting on his shock of renewed optimism. The tremolos continue, sustained by a pedal on the final woodwind chord, as his now hastily excited vocal twice rises on echoing melody notes, then, after a quaver rest, hurries through a low ash interval on reverse chord notes into static notes capped by another reverse chord note lift, making the whole phrase a prolonged melody note iteration. In his semi-quaver rest, the oboe, having sustained its last note all the way from the friar complex, descends an octave, after which Fassel's next static notes sink through chord notes into a reverse melody note pulse, making his two phrases a broad outline of Loge's scene to advice for Votan. Atop Fassold's reverse melody notes, first oboe raises an aspiring half-step further reinforced by a horn pedal. As first violins join the second violin viola tremolo, the oboe repeats Freya's arpeggio and the giant's following dotted semi-breve rest highlights her syntax's all-important love module. This break in the vocal also gives voice to second oboe's descant, which, beneath Freya's rising arpeggio, ascends into her love cell on an octave, to sink from it on chord notes, a touch reminiscent of that cell during the goddess's abduction. The first oboe's giant turn variant completes as second oboe ascends on reverse chord notes, making the whole a chord note opposition, as in the Tarnhelm. Fasolt resumes his impassioned vocal a crotchet into this bundle, declaring with unquestionable sincerity he can't give up Freya if he can see her. His voice's initial three static notes lift on reverse chord notes into a pair of falling scales reminiscent of resignation, rising from the first into the second after a quaver rest to intone the abandonment triad, his descent still more powerful on the last resignation scale, its syntax now unmistakable. Supporting these two phrases, the horn tremolo string pedal swells, augmented in the giant's last two measures by chord notes, on octavo low string flute semibreves. In his final resignation measure, all three bassoons add their chord while string tremolos break into divisi. Fafner instantly seizes the opportunity, leaping in the top chromatic extended melody notes in octavo low strings, four nibelung tattoo distortions tapped out atop them octavo by second violins violas, their initial pulses again lacking that first note, their finishing strophes distorted by dipping and rising on thirds, horn first violin pulses on their initial beat. Demanding the whole be filled, Fafner's vocal, disjointed by rests, doubles the low string's extended melody notes, to finish by plunging an octave on the word Ritze, making his entire phrase a chagrin pulse, Wotan's worst fear realized. Loge writes staccato string pulses as he tries to cut the giant off by insisting the horde is spent, his vocal reversing the heroic melody notes to hurry through Flosshilda's warning, then fall a third to skip across chagrin, making this conclusion another mark of his obsequious duplicity. But the greedy giant merely points out the ring on Wotan's finger, first punctuated by those same light string pulses, then swelling second violin viola tremolos, which, horns bass clarinet added, on the word ring, produce a double sting resembling Wotan's previous offer of the gold. Thus accompanied, Fafner's syntax-rich vocal traces reverse melody notes, an upward fourth into a static ash interval, a falling tritone, a low interval lifting a third, thus making an abandonment triad, which launches a wooing strophe as it leads to the word ring, only to plunge a cappella on the Welter triad, finished by mocking Loge with a chagrin pulse, whose falling interval is a dire octave. Wotan protests, his initial V isolated by a crotchet rest from his low ash interval on reverse chord notes as he names the ring. 
He's capped by a fortissimo pizzicato sting across all strings, a strong reminder of Albrecht's previous shock when the god demands that talisman of him. Loge attempts to run interference by saying it's the Rhine Maiden's property, an expected retort he prefaces oddly. Lass euch raten. This classically helpful rhetoric is also a reminder that, as nature entities, the giants are closer to Loge, Erda, and the Rhine Maidens than Loge is to the gods. For the good of their natural world, the fire sprite warns the titans against seizing the ring, phrasing his advice as if Photon has promised it to the nymphs, which of course the fire god knows perfectly well isn't so. Two woodwind air accord pulses in their Rhine Maiden guise ride atop disquieting violin viola pizzicati on the first and last beats of each measure, nervous cello pizzicati on each beat, making this passage Loge's fourth appeal on their behalf to leave no shadow of doubt his concern for them is sincere. His vocal, after leaping down a fifth, hops up and down air to fourths on den Rheintirschtern, then a low ash interval again on a fourth. After a minimum rest, he rises through reverse chord notes in a low ash interval to fall on reverse melody notes and a last fourth. As he asserts the ring as promised to the nymphs, would win minimum chords atop continued pizzicato string quavers buoy this vocal with a loge like cadence whose final oboe melody notes resolve into a warm major mode, the melody note opposition a coy hint loge means to save both gods and giants by dooming their racial plans. The fire sprite's earlier pleas on the nymph's behalf are sometimes dismissed as cynical, insincere, or simply calculated to annoy Votan, but this latest appeal suggests otherwise. Hard on the oboe's chromatic melody notes, Votan accuses Loge of Schwatzen, for he means to keep the ring. He sings this gauntlet to a pair of chagrin strophes, the last down a threatening octave, defying Loge's hopes. The immortal then moves to a low ash interval, rising a third to sink on a tritone, very like Fafner has just sung, then rise a fourth, a distorted ringla strophe matching the orchestra's harmonic shift, to conclude by plunging a minor seventh into melody notes, Albrecht's own defiance. Supporting him, trombones take the nymph's air chords through four pulses of an intriguing harmonic decay. Strings move amid this in a series of half-nervous, half-angry, dotted crotchet sextuplet tremolo pulses, capped with quaver stings evoking the immortal's presentation of the gold, as well as Fasold's agony over Freya just moments before. Answering him, two horns intone an almost sprightly pulse of the Rheingold tattoo, as the strings shift back to Pizzicati and Loge comes as close to begging as he ever does. The pair of horns continue their lines by extending them into reverse melody notes, that growing mark the god's new determination to save himself racially. Rising a third, Loge's vocal leads the passage with an echo of the giant turn, then bounces on Erdeforth to reverse that turn. Horns follow his giant turn, but dissent with his vocal reversal of it, bassoons joining them in a stealthy version of resignation. The most cryptic aspect here is the bassoon's entrance, which is given special emphasis by voice and horn sustaining the turn's first note. But sharp eyes, ears will recognize their arpeggio as the characteristic launch of the treaty, which informs scheming. None of these morphemes concern the Rhine Maidens, all of them specific either to the Giants, Loge, or Votan, the turn opposition only just re-emphasized as the horde is piled around Freya. What's more, the fire god's paired opposing turns echo his advice to his feckless master in scene two regarding how best to seize the ring, though in reverse order. As always, before dismissing this as Wagner merely noodling his material, it's best to look at the overall narrative context. Porter's translation has Loge sounding perplexed, while Spencer Millington's more accurate rendering is, Then things look black for the promise I gave to the grieving sisters. 
along with an inevitable sense of regret underlined by the syntax's resignation flavoring, there's also the feel of inner realization. By now, the turn has graduated into a bona fide module for the giant race's transformation, thanks to their involvement in Votan's quest for power. If they don't touch the ring, meaning if Votan instead gives it back to the Rhine Maidens, this looming change may at least be ameliorated. As go-between with the giants and advocate for the Rhine Maidens, Loge imagines he facilitates Erda's plans, yet his words, with the giant turn, endorsed by the treaty fragment, immediately opposed by the inverted turn, suggest he begins to realize he hasn't been fully informed. His thought has always been to save the giants from the ring's bane by directing it only at the prime criminals against nature, meaning Albrecht and the gods. But the Vala scheme is deeper than any such easy fix, and she apparently hasn't let the fire sprite in on her broader plan. Determined to keep the ring while pursuing his own racial plans against those of the giants, a conflict which will certainly go ill for the nymphs, Votan shrugs off Loge's promise over an echo of his first demurrer, trombone chords rising on melody notes, strings repeating their tremolo sting bundles. Atop the mix, he sings a static ash interval from which he sinks on chord notes into a chagrin strophe. Following a quaver pause and rising third, he finishes with an inverted ash interval on another third, and a second chagrin pulse, doubling down on his frustration at Loge's appeal. This silences the fire god, who says nothing more until he triggers Fasolt's murder, watching in mute disgust as the rest engage in a brief wrangle to separate god from ring. The mood shifts on the spot as violins, violas, contrabasses tap pizzicati on first and third beats, while cellos launch a nervous monotone series of triplet semi-quaver pulses capped by quavers resembling shortened Valhalla ash intervals as timpani beat giant thumps on the offbeat. This clatter supports Horn's bassoons in a trio of truncated ring pulses, which are reduced to Welt Erb triads, their rising Erda melody notes, capped by the ring fragments missing downward third, a touch drawn from the embryonic ring, yet also echoing chagrin, to emphasize that, against the expectations of all those around him, the god's mind is set on his own racial solution to Alberich's threat while keeping the ring. Not coincidentally, these figures are also the Rhinebaden's Hayea Haya module, with its sly echo in Loge's coming. Atop this growing orchestral intensity, Fafner is first to protest by cribbing the curse with a downward third and upward air to fourth, reminiscent of that morpheme's coda, topped by a plunging fifth and, after static notes and rising third, a downward seventh, Erda's inspiration driving this brutal giant towards her desired outcome. Trombone quaver stings and thirds on first and third beat increase the tension. Their procession of Erda melody notes, a subliminal rumble of the Vala slowly coming to the surface to answer this outrage. The ring module shrivels, traded between bassoons' horns and horns' clarinets in a simulacrum of the Rhine Maiden's joy, parent of the Nibelung tattoo's distinctive turn, yet still capped with plunging thirds. Six iterations of this new module rise harmonically in whole steps, timpani added to the chaos by increasing their giant thumps to twice every measure as violas on the offbeat double the cello's Valhalla ash intervals. Atop this melee, Photon offers the giants anything but the ring to a low ash interval on reverse chord notes, followed by two curse lust strophes, plunging from the second on a tritone to finish with a series of static notes that pass through a static ash interval crowned by Alberich's wooing, the god's covert sexual prerogative ever more strongly resembling Alberich's identical urge, and announced as two octavo trumpets blast the Rheingold Tattoo's first notes, unmistakable on their low ash interval.
with his vocals' final two measures, the massing orchestra rises through eight hectic back-to-back -back Rhine Maiden turns, which are now almost nibelung tattoos, timpani pounding their rhythm in the final measure. Its syntax prominent in the three climactic measures of Alberich's furious exit, since the hapless god now finds himself in something very like his conquered dwarfish adversary's frantic plight. This leads to a single climactic measure, most of the orchestra giving chordal support to violins, violas, tracing downward tonic arpeggios on sextuplet semiquavers, final notes of each sketching inversions of the heroic final erda melody notes. The initial repeated pitches of these rising forms taken together also constitute a unique outline of the treaty's initial lift, its sense of betrayal and abandonment doubled on screaming oboe flute crotchets. With this climactic measure, Fasolt seizes Freya to take her away forever, declaring their pact null and void by falling through a reverse ash interval on a third. The thunderous syntax arrests on a quaver sting, string choir alone punctuating his continued vocal with harsh quaver stings on first and third beats as he bounces up a third into another reverse interval on chord notes, slide up reverse chord notes, followed by plunging a third and lifting a fourth to intone a distortion of curse lust, identical to those first sung by his brother and the god. Fasolt plunges from it on a sixth to rise a third, yet another curse ringlust module, which he ends on chord notes, his dense sonic bouquet eloquent of the giant's resistant heartbreak, his Alberich-like fury, and the justice of his natural cause. The other gods fruitlessly plead with their leader, Freya twice crying for help on downward thirds, interspersed with Fricka's plunging fifth and rising fourth, distorting curse lust, then a pulse of Freya's love cell. Fro joins in, rising a third from a static note triplet to drop a fifth. Donner's static note triplet also ended in a downward fifth. These desperate, syntactically futile cries right atop woodwind's tremolo strings on two identical bundles, the second raised to harmonic third, both constructed from two pairs of air accords in their threatening minor mode version, followed by a third at twice the speed, which turns back on itself in melody notes. The defiant father god cries back at them, refusing to yield his vocal in two static phrases, the lift of a third at the end of each, the last begun on reverse chord notes, crowned in a low ash interval, as timpani roll and brevet tuba pedal chords underline pulsing semi-quaver violins, violas in staggered parallax, rising on furious repetitions of the treaty's ascent. It's the climax's harmony which conveys its most remarkable syntactic hint, an eerie ghost, if not a precise echo, of that distinctive shift at the peak of Albrecht's curse, with its hint of lovelessness through fear of death, echoing the same when the gods age in scene two. Wotan certainly fears the death of his immortal kind, should he lose the ring, while keeping it means they lose Freya's apples. Sustained by a pedal chord of two tied breves across tuba's horns woodwinds, upper strings climax by turning on a single pulse of the nymph's joy to fall in a tonic arpeggio echoed canonically by a second great rising falling tonic sign on cello's basses. After a last joy strophe, the violin-viola line disappears by merging with low strings, the entire rising-falling sign a titanic premonition of air to twilight, all of it swept away as trombones boom C-sharp in octavo unison. It's an entrance if ever there was one, arguably among the most stunning in all the ring. And it's here we leave it, until the next video picks up on the first stave of page 263 in Dover's full score. As always, thanks for watching and please do leave your comments. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. Hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck in your support, there's a whole lot more to come, meaning the end of Rheingold, then Die Valkyrie, Siegfried, and Goethe Dameron.